Well, hello, I'm Mike Naylor, and I'm joined by Ray Phillips, the original vocalist with the British blues and rock band, The Nashville Teens, to talk about two CDs released on Secret Records. The compilation, Tobacco Road, and the Nashville Teens live at the Nags Head, recorded in High Wycombe in 1983. It comes as a double CD and also a DVD, so you can see it in vision. Uh, the Nashville Teens have had quite a history. Formed in Surrey in 1962, they were the backing band for Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry at one time, and they toured with them, along with Carl Perkins, Bill Haley, Manfred Mann, the Hollies and the Small Faces. They enjoyed chart success in the 1960s, and Ray Phillips is still fronting the band, and they're still out playing live in 2021. Ray, thank you so yeah. much. Great to talk to you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Mike. Yeah. Nice and sunny down here. This uh, CD has been out, the compilation, for a while, but am I right in thinking that maybe it's not the originals because the recordings were done in 66, 67 and 69 with some demo tracks uh, previously unreleased in 71? Yeah, I think these were mostly compiled by, by Art Sharp, my, my old buddy, the other singer, because uh, okay. he, he was with Secret Records for a while. And... Uh, I think it was him that sort of compiled it, so I'm, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think that's how it started off. There's a combination, obviously, of your own original materials, some songs, uh, including "Tobacco Road," that was written by John D. Loudermilk, and then uh, some rock and roll standards like uh, "Lordy Miss Claudie," "Chantilly Lace," the Bob Dylan song "All Along the Watchtower," and a song by Randy Newman, "Biggest Night of Her Life." Um, yeah, was that really? Uh, this is sort of um, pretty. Um, typical of the, the mixture of songs that you recorded in those early days and went out on the road with, right? That's right, it is, yeah. Um, All Along the Watchtower was actually given to us by Bob Dylan before Jimi Hendrix did it. So uh, we recorded how, how, that how be before he, him, how, yeah. How did that happen then when, when you say uh, Bob Dylan gave it to you? Well, the guy, I can't remember his name, but the guy that... Um, recorded it in the States with Jimmy, um, with uh, Bob Dylan, came over and uh, and said that he gave us permission to do it. So, that, that, and then we just done it from there. Yeah, just done our version of it. And you like the song straight away and, and, and sort of rocked it up. It's not quite as psychedelic, I guess, as Hendrix, but it's a really strong version, isn't it? Yeah, the one, one on the live album is much stronger than the original. Yeah. Well, we'll come on to that. And... Um, you also did this song by Randy Newman, The Biggest Night of Her Life, which was slightly controversial, wasn't it? About a girl losing her virginity. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, by that time, we were sort of struggling to, to uh, bring hits out. And uh, I think because it was by Randy Newman, we thought it might stand a good chance of uh, getting in the charts, you know. And uh, there were so many bands competing for the charts in them days, you know, you just got lost in the crowd, really. And um, how did you come across Tobacco Road uh, by John D. Loudermilk? Uh, that was, again, Arthur Sharp, was it, who'd heard it? Yeah, well, Mickey, Mickey Most took us in the studio and he said, I want an album done tonight because I'm taking it to the States tomorrow. <laughs> so then <laughs> so, uh, he said, what, what's, what's your strongest number? I mean, most, most of them were covers in them days anyway. Um, so we played a couple of numbers to him and he went, yeah, that's OK. We did Parchment Farm um, and he said, yeah, that's good. Uh, you got anything else? And Arthur said, well, we've got this one that I found on an obscure record in my record shop by a guy called John D. Loudermilk, Tobacco Road. And uh, we played that and straight away he said, yep, that's it. In a typical uh, Mickey Mouse sort of way, because he was good at picking hit numbers. But the original by John was uh, sort of a country song, much slower, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, uh, John D. Loudermilk was from Nashville, but he based himself on an English gentleman. He used to wear tweeds and uh, and th thought he was more English than he was American. Uh, so he did all these numbers. I mean, he wrote so much stuff. I mean, Language of Love and... Uh, uh, Google Eye, which we did, Little Bird, which we did, Tobacco mm. Road, of course. Yeah, but he's a very, very talented writer. And uh, you, you rocked them up because you wanted to be a rock band, yet um, 
if we just talk about the history, you began in Weybridge in Surrey in 62. Uh, the name Nashville Teens is taken from an Everly Brothers song, the Nashville Blues. That's your right. Your headquarters was the Cedar Club in Kingston upon Thames, and the Baronites introduced you to an agent, Jack Fallon. And was it your first gig in Germany? It was. Well, we, we all packed our jobs up to go to Germany, yeah. Turn professional, as you call it. Uh, <laughs> Well, the boys, you know, the boys had good jobs and that. I, I was a landscape gardener at the time. And Arthur, Arthur worked in a record shop and um, the bass player was in a bank and uh, John Hawking was in the city. Uh, and uh, we all decided to give up our jobs uh, and uh, go to play in Germany, which was uh, a hell of a testing ground because you had to play like six hours a night in the week and eight hours on Sundays because you did, you did a two-hour matinee. So it's like 50, 50 minutes on and 10 minutes off. <laughs> wow. So just like the Beatles used it as a, as a sort of a, an improvement ground, uh, that really uh, helped you to become such a tight band and a tighter band, did it? That, exactly that. Yeah, you, you couldn't have done a, a better job because you just had to do it. You had to last that six hours a night. You know, it's crazy. And did we you have actually followed the Beatles into the Star Club. They left and we moved in. Did you have enough material to, to fulfil all those commitments? Well, yeah, I guess we must have. I mean, uh, John Hawking, very, very talented uh, pianist. He used to do a, a, a few instrumentals to give our voices a rest. You know, he used to do things like Nut Rocker, uh, to name one, um, and quite a, quite a few others just to give us a break because we needed it. And with two singers, sometimes one singer would just do a number and then... Uh, another one would come up well the other would do a number and then we'd both do numbers together you know just to sort of uh, try and save our voices a little bit absolutely um what were those days like then did you have quite a decent audience and you really got them rocking and and they, they responded to your music yeah it was absolutely crazy about english bands you just couldn't go wrong you could have just done a nursery rhyme and they would have cheered you know <laughs> and uh, the the scene for young men as we were then, young virile men, as you see, you know, the drinking and uh, the German girls were absolutely lovely. And uh, yeah, it was like paradise, really. And did you come across the, the Beatles while you were there? Uh, no, we never did in Germany, no. They, they saw them on the way out and we were on the way in. Uh, mm. We met them later on in, in uh, uh, BBC studios and that when we were recording and they were recording, but I used to go around Ringo's house because he lived in Wadebridge where we did. We used to go around Ringo's house and spend some time with him and uh, just to relax because they were always on tour, you know. And uh, John Lennon had a house in the hills in Wadebridge, uh, but I never got to meet him. So after all of this long stint, you still hadn't really made this first album and these recordings, had you? No, uh, I guess all that was before... Was it before Mickey Most? It must have been, yeah. Because after we came back from Germany, we uh, did a tour with, we did the tour with Jerry Lewis. And then we did the, the tour with Chuck Berry is when, I think that's when we started doing Tobacco Road on stage. Tell us what it was like, you know, being the backing band in the UK to Jerry Lee Lewis. Because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a bit volatile, really. Uh, very hard guy to get on with. But such a genius when he sat down and played. Uh, he was a bit awkward, uh, a bit grumpy. <laughs> I mean, it didn't really involve Arthur and me because the boys were his backing band. So we were sort of standing in the stage on the stage, side of the stage watching, really. But he improvised a lot. So you, the band had to work pretty hard to sort of follow him, did they? Yeah. Uh, the first meeting was in... in um, with Johnny Hamm in the studio up in Manchester. Um, and the first rehearsal with Jerry Lewis, we had a big argument with him, or the drummer did. And we were supposed to do a show that night, Johnny Hamm's show. And uh, we didn't bother, we didn't do it. I think uh, Sounds Incorporated backed him up. <laughs> but that didn't stop us doing the tour, the English tour and the German tour with him. And, and what about working with Chuck Berry? Was he uh, just as volatile? Chuck Berry is very quiet. He used to just sit in the back of the coach when we were touring and uh, in the dressing rooms when we were at, uh, on, you know, on the, the theatres and stuff. Uh, 
but he was okay. You could go and sit and chat with him uh, if he felt like it, but he kept himself to himself quite a lot. Um, can you just make sure you're in vision a bit by coming a bit forward, I think? Oh, backwards. Yeah, that's it, uh, Ray. Yeah. That's it, just there. Got it. And um, so um, you were pretty much familiar with his sort of uh, set list anyway, were you? And uh, all the rock and roll standards, I suppose. Well, yeah. I mean, everybody knew Chuck Berry numbers and we started off doing them, you know, same as us and the Stones did as well. Stones did a lot of um, early, uh, when they when they started, done a lot of early uh, Chuck Berry stuff, mm. um, as we all did. Um, so Mickey, yeah. Most, Mickey Most, did he, did he give you lots of instructions about what he wanted your sound to be like and uh, produce you? Because, of course, he uh, got an amazing track record before and after you with the animals and her permits. Later, of course, with Hot Chocolate, uh, Susie Quattro and uh, Mary mm. In and all the rest of it. Or did he? Did he just let you do what you wanted to do, and he was just there facilitating? Well, we were very limited then. There was only eight eight tracks at the most. Um, a lot of them were first went in the studio with four tracks, and the, they used to put the the singers on the on the drummer on the drummer's track. Uh, <laughs> so they were very limited to what they could do with the sound until a couple of years later, when they started getting eight tracks and sixteen tracks. You know. Mm. But, uh, you know, Nashville Teens with uh, Tobacco Road, it, it was an instant hit record, wasn't it? Top 10. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we we're very lucky there. Um, as I say, at the time, there were so many people uh, trying to get in the charts. So there's all the Liverpool, Liverpool bands and and there were just bands popping up everywhere. Every, every street corner, you see a guy, a little guy walking along with a guitar. Uh, it was crazy, crazy times. But... Um, if you had the right stuff uh, and the right manager and, and uh, the right recording, you, you were in with a chance uh, to get in with um, people like Decker and EMI, you know. You went on top of the pops on TV and thank your lucky stars, Ready, Steady, Go, the Five O'Clock Club. Uh, can yeah. you remember any of those shows and what it was like and the kind of audience reaction you got, Ray? Yeah, uh, some of them were young audiences, you know, like, um, but it was always uh, screamers and it was just like doing a normal gig, really. You just got up on stage, done your, done your number and, and got off. Um, just the audiences were either a bit younger or, or our age, you know. But live TV, was it a bit nerving, unnerving or you made you nervous or you just knew that you were, you know, sort of at the peak of your power, so to speak. So you weren't worried about that. Um, I always get butterflies before I go on, even now. Uh, I wouldn't say we were nervous because by then we were, we were pretty professional and we could go and do it anywhere, you know? Yeah. So it's just like, it's just <laughs> funny thing was being made up with all, with all the, uh, the makeup and stuff, your big orange faces. <laughs> you appeared in three films, I think, Pop Gear with the Beatles, Be My Guest with Steve Marriott and uh, Gonks Go Beat with uh, the Graham Bond organisation. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. With Ginger Baker in his his band. Ginger Baker, yeah. How did that all happen? I mean, were you just playing live in those films or miming? It's uh well, we just met at first. We just met uh, on the same gigs because coll uh, colleges and universities used to have such a budget to put music on um, that you met so many bands on one gig yeah. all over the place in the same university. You know. So that's when we first, we all played together, like with The Who and, uh, as we said, Graham Bond and uh, Jethro Tull and just, just everyone used to meet up at, at universities, really. And he all that's chatted. I first met Ginger Baker, yeah. And he all chatted about equipment and about how things were going. It wasn't sort of um, being rivals and competitive. No, I don't think it was. You got up and done your own thing. You obviously thought you were the best band on. If, if you had any, a bit of ego, you know. Um, but yeah, everybody used to come and watch everybody else. It was great. You know, we made, formed a great relationship with Spencer Davis Band, you know, when little Stevie was with them. Um, we did tour, they, they were at the Star Club with us. So I struck up quite a friendship with Steve because he was so young then. He was very, quite naive, actually, yeah. He was a great player and singer, though, wasn't he, even then? Oh, Absolutely mesmerising, yeah, when he got on the piano and sung. He's just such a talent, yeah. 
We'll talk more about Spencer Dave Cinema when we talk about your live album. But if we sort of move it along to the psychedelic era, um, you you did you feel that you maybe had to go in that direction? You wrote a really interesting record called Widdick and Fair. For the psychedelic thing, we felt we had to do it, yeah, to, to uh, well, just to go go along what everybody was doing at the time. Mm. I mean, the fact that um, you had four top forty records in 64 and 65 did did you did you feel that you deserve to have more chart success in the 60s yeah um i mean i might be wrong but i think because we had a running with mickey most um we felt that he put a stop on people taking an interest in us if you like if you if you recall the national teens or if you put the national teens on you won't get so and so and so and so you know like the animals or something like that it was all a bit cutthroat yeah because we but, uh we were in the states we we did the first two with mickey most we we had a we had a contract to do three records with him and when we we're in the st we done the two um tobacco road and google eye and then we went to the states and this guy came up with this amazing record what we thought was amazing at the time and we phoned mickey and said we'd like to record this record is it okay with you uh, you know, we can release it through you and everything. And he said, yeah, OK. But then when we got back to England, he, he denied saying that. And uh, he said, as far as I can say, you've broken the contract, you know. So you so, didn't really... Uh, we it. went from there and there was, there was a bit of a rub between us then. What was the record you wanted to record? It was called Find My Way Back Home. We did release it and I think it got in the charts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... There were certain pressures from certain organisations that they told them not to play the teens' records because, uh, or you won't get so and so and so and so, you know. Yeah, what a shame. But your your songwriting, you know, the, the um, tracks that are on this CD, um, the Nashville Teens' Tobacco Road, I've really mm -hmm. enjoyed. Whitty and Fair, and there's a couple of versions of that on. And I'm a lonely one. Yeah, I'm mean, it's kind of. Um, a contrast from the up-tempo stuff, really. So yeah, yeah, that was sort of meant to be a bit psychedelic, I think. Mm. But you, you found it too easy to, to to write songs, or do you feel that you perhaps should have written more and didn't? No, I, th I think that was the National Teens' Achilles' heel, really. The fact that we didn't write a lot of stuff between us. Um, we did mostly covers all the time. Um, we did come up with a few uh, self pen things. Uh, mostly B-sides, uh, and I think that was our undoing, really, the fact that we didn't write, we weren't prolific writers. So then Glam Rock came in, and then I guess the first sort of lineup, the uh, the successful lineup of the Nashville teams with you and Arthur Stamp on vocals, Barry Jenkins on drums, John Allen on guitar, uh, Peter Shannon on bass, and uh, the excellent John Hawken on piano. Mm. Sort of that you split up in, in 72, right? Yes, I think uh, Arthur left me in 72, yeah, very, uh, that was a bit gut-wrenching because we'd been together for years and years and we were best buddies, you know, but because the band wasn't making so much money anymore, uh, he was offered a job by Don Arden and to work in, in Czech Records, so uh, Arthur took that, I, mean, I didn't blame him, because uh, he was married at the time with, with a boy, with a child, and uh, he just had to make ends meet, if you like. So tell, take us through the, the 70s. I mean, for a time, were the teens inactive or did you then sort of put together different versions of the band yourself? Yeah, I, I, if I needed a guitarist, uh, you know, we advertised for one or, or a drummer. Uh, we, we just kept going. We never stopped. Uh, obviously, the, the, the gigs got smaller. You didn't do the great big things anymore. One or two came up for big charities and stuff, but mostly just a gigging band. Went back to being a gigging band uh, all over the country. We went into, for a while, we went into the cabaret circuit. And after a while, I I couldn't stand it. I just couldn't stand uh, doing all the airy fairy stuff that you had to do for for the, for the little clubs in, in uh, up north and that. Mm. So uh, I knocked that on the head and we went back to being a bit heavier. But you were able to keep making a living out of it is the key thing, I guess, yes? That's right. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, in 86, I started working for McLaren, the, the race team. Oh, wow. Well, let's yeah. come on to 
this because I wanted to talk about this other CD, which is an excellent double CD plus a DVD. Uh, yep. The National Teens Live at the Nags Head. This was recorded live at the Blues Loft at the Nags Head in High Wycombe in 1983. Oh. Uh, they played rock and blues and I think, and then punk. Howling Wolf played there. And the Sex Pistols played there, and you played there quite a lot before this recording was made. And uh, we did, Ron, yeah. R tell us about the, you know, the Blues Loft in High Wycombe. It was run by a guy called Ron Watts, wasn't it? Yeah, Ron Watts is a bit of a legend. He he took punk to the Hundred Club and made it really special. Um, he had his own band called Brewers Droop, which he used to perform. Um, yeah, he got us. A, we used to play regular there. And uh, we built up a following with the local bikers, mm. the Herpes Owners Club. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 so after you know getting this this following, it was decided presumably then that one day you were going to do a live gig and it was going to be like a party night. You wanted it rammed full of people and you were going to film it and record it, right? Yeah, that's right. We we felt we had to get wanted to give something back to them, something that they could. Uh, cheer and 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 then have a souvenir off uh, and uh we did just that it started off being a normal gig but it just went on for hours and hours and uh it, it was very successful you know it's one of the best things i've done really and, and what sort of crowd what size of uh, a venue was it uh, ray well it was like it said a blues loft it was just above a pub yeah and it had black sweaty walls and uh <laughs> nowhere to have a pee and you know you had to run outside it was uh it was pretty um uh, typical of, of old blues clubs in them days and uh, by then you were the lead vocalist still but you had uh, a three-piece band peter agate on guitar and vocals len surtees on bass and vocals and adrian metcalf on drums who was what he's only about 20 wasn't he adrian that's always very young yeah how did, how did he you started pick off up? being our roadie, ah. and he always, he always said, uh, well, "I could play drums." You know, I said, "Oh, can you?" You know, <laughs> didn't take much notice. And then when when I had a bit of a ruck with the drummer that we had then, um, we said, "What are we going to do now?" And he said, "Well, I know the set. I can do it." And I said, "Okay, you're on." And we we, we had a gig in Bristol, and uh, he never looked back. <laughs> He's a terrific little drummer, and he, he's still with me now. Live at the Night, Nags Head. It's a, it's an amazing uh, album. This because it's got over twenty songs, which we'll talk about. But you know the recording quality is really good. But you as a band for a four piece, I mean, you know, it's almost like driving rock and heavy metal before heavy metal was around, or perhaps it was just breaking in. With you know, yeah, yeah. it was exactly that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Peter Agate, um, he he applied for the job some time before that and got it but obviously because he was such an amazing guitarist he um modeled himself on Jimi hendrix mm -hmm. in the early days when he was boy starting out and it, it really showed through in his playing and he's a really amazing guitarist very underrated he should still be doing it now really but i don't think he is so you went for it right away uh, the first song was brought down then find my way back home the hit and then you went into a johnny winter track i think uh, rock and roll hoochie coo hoochie coo yeah and um and then uh, ready for love was that by mick ralphs or somebody else ready Scott? for love i think uh, i think that was either free i always get mixed up with free and bad company it's one of the two yeah it says ralph so i think it might be uh bad company in 83 yeah and then you do this um medley of three songs by spencer davis keep on running somebody help me in, and give me some loving they're, they're still great songs today aren't they yeah, they are. Yeah, we, we like to do that because of our association with um, with Spence, who's sadly departed now, bless him. Um, yeah, we, we used to include three of his songs as a medley in, in the set, yeah. And another cover, Steppenwolf's Born to be Wild. Oh yeah, Paul's done that from the, from the early days. And uh, of course it made it heavier with, uh, with a three-piece behind. But it's yeah, always a good crowd pleaser always though isn't it yeah we used to use that as an encore just for the, the end of the gig mainly yeah and then uh, jailhouse rock and uh, boney maroney the eddie cochran track summertime blues and then back to jerry lee lewis with the uh, great balls of fire so you're really mixed, 
sounds like you know you needed loads of energy to get through this lengthy set on this live gig yeah yeah i don't know how he did it really but i guess it's just adrenaline kicks in and a bit of guinness <laughs> johnny be good and then um the old cliff in the shadows track move it yeah we rock that up a bit four minutes 45 on this live set that's probably double the original in the studio by cliff. Oh, probably yeah <laughs> twice the length so so this uh, album live at the nags head the national teens it came out originally on seeker records in 2018 um mm. what happened to the tapes i mean did did you not know that they were around or did it just take a while to get to get the um the concert out there to be get it released well for a couple of years we we, we had a, a lovely manager called andrew kilderry and um he used to organise us, obviously, he managed the band and got the gigs. And then after he left, I suppose it must have been, well, when did, when did we come out now? 2018? Yeah. Yeah, well, just before that, probably 2017, he phoned me up and he said, I found the tapes to, to that next head, next head gig you did. And uh, he says, I'm going to try and pedal them around. He says, I, I, I know there's, there's, a, there's a company called Secret Records. And I said, well, I know those. He said, the Sharp used to work there. And he said, I'm going to approach those and see if they're interested. And, and they were. Yeah. Uh, Lars uh, phoned me up and said he was going to be interested in doing it. They, they obviously digitally enhanced them a bit because... The recording was just on one small desk and uh, as as was the the video it was just one camera just flashing around you know and really? i've never i've never watched it i've never watched it and i've never heard the whole album together i don't what? know why i just don't like listening to myself well on that note i was going to ask you um how would you assess your career and the career of the national teens uh, Ray, you know, how did you put it in perspective? Do you sum it up in in a way? You must be proud of some of the stuff you you've put out. Well, I've absolutely loved it. Yeah, ever ever since I I, I left the arm I left the army in sixty, um, and then in sixty two we 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 were already forming national teams, and I've just loved every time really. It's a bit sad losing certain members in the beginning, but our, our bands evolve. You know, they they go off and different directions whether they go to another band or whether they just have something different in life because they're fed up with music but I never have been I've always been very sad if I didn't have gigs coming up soon you know so I always look forward to it no matter where it is uh just to get out there and perform really it's almost 60 years in the business rate I mean that's an incredible track record isn't it a lot grief, of yeah, yeah, I suppose it is really. I'm very lucky that I haven't lost my voice yet. Uh, I really uh, thank my lucky stars about that, you know, because uh, a lot of a lot of singers have lost their voices by now, or they've gone gravelly, or you know. I wanted to ask: no. Do you have to do you have to sort of regular regularly work it out between gigs at home just to keep it in in trim, so to speak? Um, I've got a little shed in the garden, a little summer house, and I, I put records on that I know the words to, and I sing at the top of my voice uh, just to records, really. I don't play an instrument. I play guitar a little bit. Um, but uh, I have another little side band that we go out and do gigs with as well, as well as the national scenes. Um, we just go out and do a few pub gigs in it here and there, which keeps the voice in trim. Mm. And uh, so, the the you still need a lot of energy, though, do you, to get up on stage? Because these are these are just, you know your set is pretty rocky set, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, uh, you do you need to uh, be able to stand up for an hour, hour and a half, and uh, and jig around a bit. Yeah, I'm not as agile as I was, obviously. Uh, the older. Uh, rheumatism in the knees and things like that you know <laughs> if, you, if you say you haven't got pain when you're my age you're a liar you know <laughs> well <laughs> you're, you're playing in september 2021 at the alford rock and blues festival in surrey and on the same bill as uh, john coglin's quo wishbone ash uh dr feel good and the groundhogs yeah I mean, that's a that's a fabulous lineup. So, um, what sort of length of set will you be doing when you go to that? I think we're doing um, uh, either fifty minutes or an hour set. They don't allow us to do any more. 
it's very strict as well if you, you've got to come off on the go on on the dot and off on the dot otherwise you get too much uh slowing down of other bands going on and it, it takes a gig on too late mm. and and there's a 60s autumn weekend i think with the mersey beats the swinging blue jeans uh, cupid's inspiration mike berry and the outlaws that's yeah. in somerset i think so um, is it is it good fun meeting up with some of these people that you know you, you you used to play with back in the day yeah it is yeah it's always good i've always been good friends with, with um dave berry uh it's always nice to meet up again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All, all, all bands from my era. I don't know how many uh, original members are left in it or how many I'll know. But uh, yeah, they're all there. So how long will you continue to sing live and perform live, Ray? Oh, well, I, I can't say. Well, uh, one day if I wake up and say I don't want to do it anymore or um, I'll get halfway through a gig and my voice packs up and it doesn't come back again. <laughs> I don't know. Who says? I mean, it won't. It won't be um, a, a conscious decision like, oh, I'm not going to sing after I'm a certain age. Uh, it won't be that sort of decision. It, it will be uh, something that makes a decision for me, I guess. Well, I always it, said I could be an old blues singer uh, if I don't. If I can't do all the rocky numbers, I could still do some blues numbers, probably like like Bob Dylan was still doing. You know. Yeah, and he's 80s, he's a lot older. So uh, you sort of got into the blues early on, didn't you? Your, your dad got into country and western, but you got into American blues, I think, before pop came along, before rock and roll came along. That's right. Yeah, I did. Uh, I was very interested in it. My dad was a country and western singer. And uh, Josh White was my hero then. He, he was um, an old blues man. And they used to listen to uh, John, Robert Johnson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the, all the old blue, I mean, the, the recordings, I mean, scratchy, just a, a guy on a guitar uh, on an old, old bit of um, vinyl. You know, it wasn't vinyl, it was wax then, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been fantastic to hear some of your great stories and your memories. And I, I do recommend the Nashville Teens Tobacco Road on Secret Records compilation and this Live at the Knack's Head recorded in 1983 in High Wycombe. And there's a yep. fantastic um, sleeve notes to this, to both the CDs on Secret Records and some great um, pictures of the, 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 the posters that uh, incorporated the gigs that you played on. I see there was one where you actually played with Johnny Marr or on the same bill as Johnny Marr. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. The Smiths <laughs> I didn't know that. Be the same Johnny Marr. So, I mean, as I say, you know, it's been really brilliant talking to you, Ray. Ray Phillips, oh, it's been, it's lead been singer. A pleasure. Themes, really fantastic memories. Um, I grew up listening to Tobacco Road on Pirate Radio, I've got to tell you. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I mean, uh, Days of the Pirates, that, that was great. Yeah, Caroline. Yeah. They, they gave us a big boost. A big L and all the rest of it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll never see those days again, sadly, I don't think. But, sadly uh, not. No, no. So, we mustn't lose the feel, though. We, we've got to keep doing the old stuff as well, because uh, people have be able, got to have the choice of the modern music and uh, the old stuff. I still get but lots of uh, young people coming up to me now and said, oh, you played there and there. And he said, oh, you, you, the words weren't right when you did that. And <laughs> these are you know, old blues records. And it's nice to know that there's still some young people uh, that are into the blues and stuff and uh, R&B and stuff. Well, thank you, Ray. It's really kind of you talking to me. Thank you for your time. Really great. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Mike. I'll just stop that and then we'll have another quick chat off air. Uh, okay. that, was, that was fantastic. Uh...